Well, we're in this uh, the series on um, welcome home and um, how the Bible uses um, messages about fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, families in order to explain to us who he is. And this week, um, I've titled this The Silent Partner. And uh, don't read more into that than what you know this kind of a dangerous talking about women and calling them the silent partner but um we know all know that's not true to begin with right it's uh, i I, i've had so many experiences through the years i've never been in a church that didn't allow women to do things you know uh and i respect churches that do that but i've just never been one of those churches that said only men could do this and women have to do that but i have had times when um we would have a meeting with maybe five or six men and we would reach consensus on something and say yes this is what we're going to do and then they went home and then later they said you know I've been thinking about this I'm not sure that's the right thing to do and and it's it's like well okay you talk to your wife that's all right we should have had you know she's always kind of in the room anyway but What I was thinking of when I entitled this Silent Partner was I was really thinking of business arrangements where there's a silent partner. And in those arrangements, you know, a lot of times you'll have a partnership with somebody's behind the scenes that you, uh, whose name isn't on the marquee of the business. And I'm not saying that women should be silent by any means and whose name shouldn't be on the marquee, but in in business you realize that the silent partner sometimes is is an equal partner, is not less than the non-silent partner. It's just that he or she doesn't get all the credit for it. Men in ancient times had all the power in the family. And and that's the way where the Bible comes to us is from ancient times. And they had all the power and, and women really didn't have any power, but that doesn't mean that they were any less. And I wanna give us first from Genesis 1 26. This is by design. Um, God made them equal. It says here that God said, let us make man in our image. And he doesn't mean gender, male. Uh, here it means let's make human beings in our image after our likeness. And then and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female he created them so from the very beginning uh, the image of god is carried not just in the man god is not male males cannot carry the full image of god but the the image of god was carried in the man and the woman it it takes both of them to carry god into this world And, and remember that these words were first heard in a culture where the males completely dominated it was a patriarchal culture so the males completely dominated the culture and to them this would have been very radical to say that god has made a woman in the image of in his own image would have been a very radical statement but the relationship between the man and the woman is defined even more clearly in this the second account of creation where the man has been made first and then if you remember that it's in the second chapter of genesis um, the the man uh, is naming all the animals and he finds no uh, suitable partner there for him no compliment so this is from genesis 2 18 it tells us just a little bit more then the lord god said it's not good that the man should be alone i will make a helper fit for him and that that verse has some potential misunderstanding uh, it has been and continues to 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 be the word helper for most of us kind of makes us think of boss and helper and and you know sometimes men get married thinking I'm going to get me a helper because I need somebody to tell what to do and it doesn't work out that way you know so uh, but but anyway the helper is kind of leads us down that road but that's not the plan here the new american bible says i will make a suitable partner for him uh, the Good News Bible says, I will make a suitable companion to help him. And the purpose of the woman was to be the complement of the man. Uh, those of you who are married will learn that seldom does God bring two people together that have the same strengths and weaknesses. But strangely, we're attracted to our complement 
where we're strong, she's weak, and, and vice versa. So that's what's meant here, a suitable, a complementary partner. And when, women sometimes joke that uh, had God created the woman first, that there would just be women because he would have got it right the first time and didn't need to make a second try. But uh, I, don't, I don't think we really believe that. So now a little word of caution here. This does not mean we, we think, well, the man was incomplete until he had a woman. This does not mean that if you're single, that you are incomplete. God isn't talking about a particular couple. He's talking about all of humanity, that the world needs men and women. He's not saying in any regard that if you are not married, that you are less. And in, 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 in sometimes, you know, there's benefits both ways. Let's be honest about it. But, but that doesn't mean that, that you are less because you haven't found your complement yet. Just, just uh, you know, so many people go through life, sometimes singles go through life thinking I'm, I'm not uh, who I should be because I'm, I'm, I'm not happy yet because I haven't found this person. And then they go through a lot of pain trying to find that right person to make them happy. And that's a whole nother sermon, isn't it? But the world needs men and women. But generally speaking, men and women are, are different. Uh, we think differently. We are obviously physically different. Our, our emotions are different. And the design of creation says that both are needed, not just one, but both men and women are needed. Um, the following quotes uh, represent two imaginary journal entries as a wife and her husband reflect on the same day's events. Here's the wife's journal. She says, tonight my husband was acting weird. Uh, we'd made plans to meet at a nice restaurant for dinner. Conversation wasn't flowing, so I suggested that we go somewhere quiet so we could talk. He agreed, but he didn't say much. I asked him what was wrong. He said nothing. I asked him if it was my fault that he was upset. He said he wasn't upset, that it had nothing to do with me and not to worry about it. On the way home, I told him that I loved him. He smiled slightly. I kept driving. When we got home, he just sat there and watched TV. He continued to seem distant and absent. Finally, with silence all around us, I decided to go to bed. About 15 minutes later, he came to bed, but I still felt that he was distracted and his thoughts were somewhere else. He fell asleep. I don't know what to do. Here's the journal from the man's entry, the man's journal that day. Rough day boat wouldn't start. Can't figure out why. <laughs> we are very different animals that process things differently, aren't we? And, and the roles in each culture are different, you know? In some cultures, the men are dominant and the women aren't. In some cultures, the more equal. And I'm not going to tackle that thing today, but what I would just want to state is that in my opinion, the equality of men and women is best demonstrated by God on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit fell upon the men and the women alike. The Holy Spirit did not just fall upon the men. But at that time, uh, Peter had a sermon, it's in Acts 2, and he he mentions the prophecy of Joel from Joel the second chapter about this day would come when God would pour out his spirit in the latter days and would fall upon male and female, young and old, they would, he would fall. And I think the greatest example of equality is when people are full of the spirit and dedicated to God and the gender roles just kind of fall away in that. But they're still different than yet equal. Now, I want to go uh, through a powerful story today in the Old Testament about a woman who had no power, very little influence, a typical woman in ancient times, and, and God worked through her in a simple way to bring about his will and to bless so many people through a woman. And she shows us what it means to surrender a God to God. Her name is Hannah. And we find her story in 1 Samuel 
in chapter 1. I'm going to read some of it, but if you want to turn there, that's fine. Uh, this takes place in, in the days of when, when there were just tribes in Israel, and they kind of had these city-states. Uh, it's right after Joshua's had, had gone through, and they pretty well conquered the land. But this is in the time of Judges. The book of Judges uh, carries some of these stories. And we have famous judges, like one of them was named Deborah, a woman. Then you'll recognize some others. Uh, Gideon was one of the judges. Samson was one of the judges. But at that time, there was not yet a temple. There was still the tabernacle, the tent of, tent of meeting. And so they would make these pilgrimages to the tabernacle to worship there. And the tent of meeting was at Shiloh. And we have the story of a man whose name was Elkanah and his two wives, Peninnah and Hannah. And this is from 1 Samuel 1, beginning with the fourth, fourth verse. And on that day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, but the Lord had closed her womb. One of the wives is Hannah, and she has this problem. It's a very serious problem. She's barren, which means something completely different in their day than what it does in our day. Because they considered a woman who was barren to be almost cursed. They, they thought that if you could not bear children, they had no biological understanding. They thought it was all, you know, the, the man could never have a problem. It was always the woman. And they thought if the woman could not bear children, then she evidently had done some sinful thing. But uh, she can't have children. And she's, there's some other stories of women that are barren. We remember uh, Sarah, uh, wife of Abraham, who was barren. And we think of Rachel, who was barren. Later on, we think of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, that was barren. They all, all those stories turn out so great. But uh, Hannah's in good company here. And it says that her husband loves her. And, and he's the sensitive male, guys. Okay, She's got a big problem, but he says, aren't I enough? You know, you're fine. You're, you're just great the way you are. You don't need to change, honey, at all. You're fine just the way you are. But he feels her pain, but he kind of makes things more difficult because he gives her a double portion, you know, when they go to the temple to, or to the tabernacle to worship. And her rival then just really rubs it in to her. Ah, you can't have kids. You know, you're nothing. There's my kids over here. So 1 Samuel 1, 7 to 8. And it says, So it went on year after year, and as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? What a guy. You know, bless this man. He says, you're, you're fine, honey, just the way you are. Can you imagine that? Honey, you don't need to lose 10 pounds. I love you the way you are, you know. You don't need children, you know. You're, you're better than 10 sons. And, but every year it's the same thing. She goes to God and she's broken by the fact that another year has passed and she still feels like she's cursed by God. And the pressure isn't coming from her husband. He says, you don't need kids. You know, I've got kids by another wife. And the family's fine. You have me. Now, I know that whole polygamy thing is kind of a stretch for us to understand. But in their days, it was okay. It was permissible. You know, the, the function of the primary function of the wife was to have children because you had to have sons because women, daughters got married and moved off. But you had to have sons. This was your security in the family. So let's go on. First Samuel 1, 9 to 11. And after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, that's the tabernacle, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord, and she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And, he, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but I will give to you to your servant a son but will give to your servant a son then i will give him to the lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head that's that's his vow that they would make 
Um, means he became what was called a Nazarite, which was a person that was just totally dedicated to God. Now, we shouldn't think that this is the first time that she's prayed this, prayed about this. Year after year, this has been her constant prayer. Oh, Lord, give me a son. If I just had a son, my life would be great. But they're, they're, they're in the tent, and it's just all we have is, is Hannah and Eli, the priest that's there, and she's broken. And she says, I've just got one problem in life. My only problem in life is that I need a son. Because you see... That other lady is just irritating me. You know, she's just rubbing it in. And all she has is God. I mean, if, if she were a man and she needed a son, she'd just, get another, he'd just get another wife. But a woman, you know, all she can do, this can only be resolved by God. And that's the way it was. It's all up to the Lord. So she makes this promise. She makes a vow. And she wants a son so badly. This is the one thing in life more than anything else, a son. She's considered to be a cursed woman. God has said before they went to the promised land that everybody will have sons. Even, even all of your livestock, everybody is going to just have all kinds of, of offspring, but she doesn't. So what's wrong with me, she says. What have I done that I, I can't bear a child? What have I done? Every year she goes to worship, and every year it's the same, only it's a year later and her biological clock is kind of running out. Every year it gets worse. So she gives God her son before she ever has a son. And don't misunderstand this. You know, I say, well, she's kind of bargaining with the Lord. It's kind of quid pro quo kind of thing where she said, Lord, you do this for me. I'll do this for you. That's not what's going on here at all. What she wants more in life is any one thing. You know, and there's nothing she can do. And she gives this one thing to God. She does not vow in order to receive, but she vows in surrender to God. And she has a son. His name's Samuel. When he's weaned, probably about three years old, she takes him back to the tabernacle, to Eli, and she leaves him there. Now, think about this for a minute. Can you imagine doing that? Can you imagine taking your son to the priest, the son that you prayed for and prayed for and prayed for, the son that you wanted more than anything else in the world, and you take him and your little boy, he's just three years old. I mean, he was just kind of a, a hope or a dream. It was imaginary. Now he's flesh and blood and he calls you mama. And you take him to the priest and you turn around and leave him there and you go home? I mean, gee, you're everything to him. He's everything to you. You're the most important person in his life. And yet you take him there and you leave him. You take him at age three and you give him to the priest and you turn around and you think, you know, here's my boy God gave me and here's the one I vowed to give the Lord. And, and you worship and you kiss the little guy and you leave him there with his jammies and in his backpack and you just go on home. It's Hannah. I, I challenge you to find any story that's greater than this in Scripture of a person that has more faith than what Hannah has. I challenge you to find it. There might be some equals, but I don't think there's anything any greater. What she did and what God did with her gift uh, to him stands as the, the greatest change for good that could have happened in Israel. And this is where you've got to know some things behind the scene. You see, Eli, the priest, has got two rotten sons. <laughs> and they're destined to be the rulers of Israel. And if they become the rulers of Israel, things are going to go bad. But instead, what happens with this one woman's desire, and she leaves it with God, she gives it to God, and God gives her a son named Samuel, who is one of the greatest leaders that Israel ever had. Because I searched this whole story of 1 Samuel. And you know, you've heard from me before. Every man in Scripture has a downfall. There's some place. Everybody does something bad. And they always record that. I can't find it in Samuel. I can't find the word says that he ever did anything wrong. He was a great leader. He turns out being the priest. He turns out being a judge. He turns out being a prophet. He's the one that chooses the kings, Saul and then David. And the whole story of Samuel is one of honor 
and, and prays to God. And it's because of his mom. It was ordained by his mother to do that. It, it happened because a woman believed in God. A woman believed in God that God would give her the desire of her heart to first. And the woman prayed a prayer of surrender and said, in essence, God, I just want to serve you. God, would you take my dream? Could I leave my dream with you, Lord? Take my one desire. Then we might think, well, that's, gosh, Don, that's Mother's Day. That's a sad story. A woman leaves her three-year-old at the temple, you know. And Hannah didn't feel that way. Listen, she's a prophetess, and if we, you read on to the second chapter, she sings this song, and it's a great. The second chapter, is, I think it's like 11 verses long. It's just, I'm just going to read two verses for us today, but listen to the first couple lines. It says in 1 Samuel 2, 1 to 2, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. That means she's filled up. She's blessed. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. That make a good praise song. There is no rock like our God. But that's what, she, that's what she prays to God. There's no sorrow here. There's no regret. She doesn't think, gosh, I wish I wouldn't have, wish I would have said I'd give him to him for a month or, you know, uh, one year. There's no regret. It's just all joy. My heart exalts in the Lord. No sadness. She's filled with joy. Why? Because she knows, listen, she knows that God can do more with her son than she can ever do on her own. Uh, this isn't just for mothers, this is for all of us. See, that moment four years before when she was in deep anguish and she gave up her control to the Lord, from that moment on, that boy was God's. From that moment. So it's all joy. There's no sorrow. There's no pain in leaving because she knew that with God, he would do great things because she had given up her manipulation and her control and her one desire and God had received it. There's no sadness there, no regret when we give God the things that are God's. Oh, and the rest of the story, she went on to have three more sons and two daughters. See, three more sons and two daughters. God's a good God, isn't he? You give him what your heart's desire, you give it to him, and he blesses you beyond what you can contain, much more than what you would ask. So what God teaches us through Hannah in a few areas, just, just want to touch on a few things here as we close. Now, I want you to remember this woman whose greatest accomplishment in life, her greatest accomplishment was giving her son to God. It's the biggest thing that she did, and she changed history just with that one thing. So the first thing I want us to remember here is that when we set our hearts on what we do not have, we are robbed by what we do have. Get that? When we say, I just need this. This one thing is all that I need in life. We're getting robbed of all these things that we've already received. Hannah had a great husband. <laughs> wow. He, he was a man of faith. He was a man of means. He, he loved her. He cared for her. He was enough. There's no doubt about it. But not for Hannah. Every year it got worse. She could only think of a son. And we hear this in her dialogue. If I only had a son, then everything would be right in life. I could be happy if I only had a child. And on numerous occasions, I, I've known and heard of couples who struggle with infertility. Maybe some of you here today have struggled with infertility. It's, it's such painful thing because you get your hopes up and then it doesn't happen and and you know it's it's the blame game often goes between couples and pretty high rate of divorce sometimes for couples who who play this in for, have the infertility problem a lot of blaming sometimes it's difficult for marriages but but then i've i've seen seen witnessed and heard stories of couples sometimes that that they try and they try and they try to have children and then they give up then they have a child had a cousin that, that was, was in that and trying, trying, trying to have children and adopted and then had one naturally. Once, once the pressure was off for some reason, things happened. Now that, that, that's not going to happen all the time, obviously. But sometimes we want something so badly that we don't have that we're not appreciating what we already have. We set our hearts on what we do not have. We're robbed of what we do have. Now, 
that works on Mother's Day, that works on any day. We're finding today in our culture so often that women that, that work outside the home feel guilty that they're not home and women that are in the home feel guilty that they don't have a job, you know. And just kind of think about that. Of if, if only I had this, you see, then I would be somebody. I would be happy if only I could achieve this in life. And we don't really treasure what we've got. The Ten Commandments calls this coveting. We, we want what the neighbor has. We want his, his house. We, you know, we want her job, um, his parents, etc. It's a thief. The second thing here I want us to take away is that all children are God's children, not ours. They're never our kids. We play this game where we think they're our kids, but they're not our kids. There's a difference between ownership and stewardship. You can't own your kids. You think you own your child, and you think you're in control. I want you just to ask a few questions right now. If you have kids, just ask yourself this question. Can you make him or her do what is best? No, you can't. Not even at age one can you make them do what's best. Can you keep them from doing stupid things that hurt themselves? No, you can't make them do stupid. Can you heal them? Can you keep them out of danger at all times? Can you be everywhere? Can you know everything? Are you all powerful? Of course not. See, they're never really ours. They're always God's. Parents have been chosen by God to kind of be his field agents and his hands and his voice, but they're never ours. And trust me, there will be some days when you would like to give them to God quickly. I, I really believe that adolescence is God's kind of plan there that convinces us at that time, age 12 or 13, that they really do need to leave the house. You know, we really do need to leave them over to God. This week I was at the dentist office and a young lady was uh, working on my teeth and the entire time, don't you love being at the dentist office and they ask you questions, you know, I, 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 you know, you're like this and they're carrying on this conversation, you can't really say anything. So for about a half an hour, 45 minutes, it was just a one-sided conversation and she was telling me about her son and, you know, loves him so much, but he's going through all these problems right now. And, you know, she didn't know what to do, and, and she says, I spoiled him, I know, I know it's all my fault, I've bailed him out so many times, and, and I listened, and you know, I hate to be the pastor in those situations, always telling people what to do, because I don't know what to do, but I really felt, I really felt the Lord impressing upon me this time to, to open up my mouth, and I didn't give her advice. We were all done, and finally she, she got all the instruments out of my mouth. And I said, could I give you a little spiritual tip here? And she goes, yeah, I guess. I said, why don't you pray? Why don't you pray for him? Why don't you give him over the Lord? Because you're really frustrated. You can't do anything, and she's got all these problems, and she's a mess at fixing them. It's just getting worse and worse. And I said, have you ever? She goes, I prayed today for the first time on the way to work for him. I said, okay, well, see, we're in the spirit here. You know, God's working on something. Give him up to the Lord in prayer every day. He's not yours. He's God's. If you want his life to be blessed, you give that ownership over to the Lord. Let the Lord do the work. Give him, you know, maybe the what we should say is, Lord, you've given me a son. Now I give him back to you, just like Hannah did. Lord, you gave me a child, so I'm going to give him back. When they're about 18, the last week of school, oh, everybody's giving them back to God. Believe me, if you've ever had a kid that's, that's in that situation. The third thing I want, to, I want you to say is really tied into that, and it's the battle is one on our knees. Um, I think mothers really know this more than fathers. Uh, there's a bond between a child and mother that's unique, and like Hannah, mothers who serve uh, God, pray for their kids, and part of that process is surrender. They're always giving their kids to God. They, they know that the more, most important thing they can do to, is pray. Many of us in the, are in the faith because the prayers of mothers, because they prayed for us. They prayed us into the kingdom of God. Many of us are. And they, they oftentimes are the silent partners. They're the ones who maybe don't make the big statements, get all the recognition, but they do the work on their knees. 
And yet even in the midst of the weakness, like Hannah, who was scorned by her peers, we find that, that, that a woman are, is, is open to God in ways that only a weakness can open up. You hear what I'm saying? She had to get to that point of desperation before she would dare give her one desire to God. And they pray, they surrender. And men, well, maybe we look on and we learn what it is to have that kind of spiritual power and to move heaven not by might or not by our words, but by our prayers. And really, last week we looked at how God was like a father, and this week I want us to, to see that God is like a mother as well. Um, mothers take great delight in their kids. Not the fathers don't, but mothers usually know what the kids want to do. If, if, if the child wants to um, learn baseball, the mother will learn baseball with the kid. If, if the child is just fascinated with birds, then the mother learns the name of the birds. You know what I mean? Mothers want to fulfill that in the child. And Hannah wanted a son so badly that she gave him to God. And God, like Hannah, God wants to give him yours. Are you his son? He, he, he wants what's best of you for you so much that he wants to give to you what you need the most, which, which is the presence of his son in your life. And that's how God's like a mother. He takes pleasure in seeing you laugh. He takes pleasure in seeing you happy. He takes pleasure when you are in life to the greatest, no matter what you're doing. God is enjoying that. He wants to see you alive. And so he says, I'm going to give to you the life giver, the one person, his son, who can do that, who can change your life. And that's how God is like a mother. What are we going to give him in return? Okay, what are we going to give him back? There's only one thing I can think of. Let's, let's pray for a moment. As deep cries out